welcome to Logi Talk. I am your host, Gabriella Day, and this is our eighth episode. Today with our special guest, we will be diving into diversity and the intersectionality of disability. The amount of people living with disabilities around the world is far greater than most people realize. Individuals come from all walks of life and each have incredibly different stories, identify as different races, religions, ethnicities, gender identities, sexual orientations, and socioeconomic classes. Despite the prevalence of people with disabilities in our lives, many of us lack an understanding of the depth, the complexity, the politics, and the history of people with disabilities. My guest today embodies a powerful understanding about the lack of awareness for this topic better than I have ever heard it put before. He says disability is something that can affect anyone at any time and no one is exempt from it. My guest today also knows intersectionality at a very deep level, and I am grateful that he will be sharing all the twists and turns of his journey with us today. My guest is Carson Tuller. Carson's life took an unexpected turn in 2013, which is the year in which he injured his spinal cord in an accident that broke his neck, paralyzing him from the chest down. He also came out as a gay man. Nearly everything about his life shifted, causing the identity crisis, which would act as the impetus for self-discovery and exploration. Shortly after his spinal cord injury, Carson began sharing his experiences as a gay, disabled man, including his journey with grief, loss, and work. He also began speaking across the U.S. to universities, corporations, and nonprofits about how individuals can experience power, happiness, and fulfillment in any circumstance in life. As part of his journey, Carson also immersed himself in transformational education, earning a BS in psychology, and receiving extensive training in ontological coaching methods. Carson continues to speak, write, and coach, and most recently finished working on a 2020 presidential campaign as a policy advisor. He currently resides in New York City. Hi, Carson. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Welcome to Logi Talk. How are you? Thank you. I'm good. I am so awesome. excited to be here. Thank you for that very generous introduction. <laughs> it's not generous. It's just the truth. It's your life. Um, I'm I'm very, very honored to introduce you and be able to talk to you today. Um, and I think it's best if we jump right in because your story is incredibly rich. So mm. I want you to share with the audience that is watching and listening um, in your own words. Okay, so my story, which, where would you like me to start? We can start in 2013. Great. Okay, so I'm actually going to start in 2012. Do I have okay. a Okay, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, perfect. So I grew up in a Mormon family. And so in 2012, I had just come home from a serving a Mormon mission. So I had lived in Chile for two years and um, had been closeted, obviously, for a very long time up until that point. So I got back from my mission and part of the uh, expectation for young men in that culture is that you come back from your mission and then you get married. So wow. I was right in the process of realizing that I wasn't going on any dates. I wasn't, I was starting to deal with my sexuality for the first time um, in a really difficult, complex way. So I came out to my parents and then slowly started coming out to, you know, closer um, groups of people and friends and things like that. And then kind of finally came out and I was dating my first boyfriend when um, I decided to go to a trampoline park with my family in 2013. So it was December of 2013 and I was studying pre-med and also doing music performance. I was a flutist and uh, my family was going to this trampoline park with my cousins. So I used to tumble, loved trampoline parks. And so I was gung ho, we all went and, um, at that trampoline park, I tumbled into a foam pit and I ended up breaking my neck. So in that accident, I broke the 
basically like the base of my spine. Uh, sorry, the base of my neck, right? Kind of between your neck and your back. So um, that paralyzed me from the chest down. So I'm actually a quadriplegic. And thus began my journey with disability while I was kind of coming out and exploring like a faith transition and all of these other really big things. Um, and I was immediately flown to get two spinal fusions, two surgeries, and then started a very long recovery process. So that was eight years ago. And wow. like you mentioned, it was the beginning of how everything in my life changed. And yeah. when I say everything, I mean, like the way I sneeze is different. The breath, every breath that I take is different. And I could no longer play the flute. I could no longer run and swim. And I was this six, five athlete who saw the world in a very particular way. And suddenly I was going through life in a power chair and having people interact with me like a completely different human being. Right. And so I had big questions like, who am I and how am I valuable to society? And am I broken? Will I ever be happy? Um, what does it mean to be disabled? I mean, just like on and on and on. So that's, that, that is how all of it began. It was that yeah. very formative year. And I even read somewhere that immediately after the accident, you knew you turned to someone in your family and you knew you were paralyzed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was in the foam pit, yes. So when I when I entered the foam, I went through the foam, through a trampoline, and hit concrete at the bottom. Oh. So it kind of like hit the back of my head like that. Uh, by the way, it was not my fault. It was a, uh, a kind of like a liability issue to be Oh, so, and we'll get into liabilities later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So my dad, my whole family was there. My dad had been watching. So he jumped into the pit to make sure that no one moved me because he suspected that I had some kind of like spinal trauma. And um, he came and I said, dad, I think I'm paralyzed. And he said, I know my boy, my boy. That's really all he could say while we were waiting. It's just my boy. And um, I was just trying to kind of comfort him actually because I felt a a lot of calm and peace in those moments, surprisingly. Um, anyway, so yeah, that's, that's no, immediately. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, mm. I don't think that's something many people can put themselves in until they are in that position. And so you explaining that with such clarity is very sobering for mm. a lot of us, I'm mm. sure, to hear. Um, the next thing that I want to try to understand, because we've all been through parts of our lives where we have to transition into another part, you were dealing with two transitions yeah. at one single point in your life, two yeah. big ones, coming out as a gay man, and now you are going from an able-bodied person to somebody who is dis disabled, dealing with a disability. Yeah. What was going through your mind? how did the people react to you around you? Mm. And what did you feel like the next steps were? Did something have to take the back seat? Did you know how to integrate the two? I, I just, so many questions, but mainly what were you feeling transitioning from one drastic identity to another? Yeah, it's such a good question. Um, it was... Um, messy is really the only way I can describe it, you know? Um, and it felt like there were so many moving parts that some days I was dealing with a lot of grief around my disability. And so that day or that week just happened to be processing grief and loss and frustration or what's next. Right. Right. And when your spinal cord, when you injure your spinal cord, um, you know, uh, your goal is to learn how to live again. You have to do everything for the first time. So my my hands are paralyzed. That's that's partially why I'm quadriplegic is because I have paralysis in all four limbs. So I had to learn how to like eat again, wow. right? And then I had to, so, so in terms of spinal cord injury, it was first very much about physical survival. How do I go to the bathroom? How do I push a wheelchair. 
How do I get from this chair into a bed so that I can sleep? So it's kind of basic life skills. Um, and a lot of the kind of processing the grief and the identity came when I got home, kind of the three months later. But um, during all of that time, I would also have moments of a lot of distress around kind of what I was dealing with my sexuality because it was at such odds with my faith. And so that faith transition with the, with the um, kind of the coming out process was, was very difficult. So it was kind of just going back and forth between those things. And I would slowly incorporate some new things into my process as I kind of rediscovered who I was. But, um, you know, like something like dating, like, yeah. all right, well, how do I, I, I barely knew how to like gay date before my injury, you know, so I was like <laughs> trying to experience like the queer community now well, for the first time while I experienced my disability for the first time. Yes. You know, so yes. it was just like so difficult to isolate these different variables and and have an experience just inside of queerness because now it was like I was disabled and queer together and that was never not going to coexist for me. So how do I tease out those differences it was just like very complex and i didn't have a lot of spaces to yeah. go and find other queer disabled people who were experiencing the same thing so i don't i wish i had a a clearer answer for you in terms of how no that no there's, CMS. there's nothing clearer than your own experience and your own words and i i received everything that you were saying it mm -hmm. messy is a great word to describe it um yeah. because I would say going from just one drastic identity, I don't think most people experience that in their lifetime. And when they do, they're not as brave as you have been to share it. Mm. So mm. when you went through that change mm. and it was that messy period, how long did that take? And when do you think you actually started to find some strength in your new identity? Mm. I began to find some strength. I had whisperings of that strength in the hospital. Um, because I remember very vividly being in my hospital room and just being like, who am I? And it was the first time that I realized that I had put so, placed so much of my identity into what my body could and couldn't do, right? Like if you said, who is Carson Tuller at, you know, the day before my injury, I would have handed you a piece of paper that had a list of items of things that I could do, right? So like, I'm a flutist, I'm a musician, I'm a swimmer. I'm a, like all of these things that were attached to physical function or kind of almost like some other characteristic or attribute, something I had achieved. It was like my identity was very outsourced, if that makes sense. Yes. And when all of that left, I was really like, I had no idea what made me me. And I had this like existential kind of crisis of like, what does it mean to be me? What does it mean to be any of us? Yeah. What does it mean to be you, right? Like, yeah. Who are we? And so that's when I really kind of started getting into philosophy and these big questions. But, um, you know, I started to have inklings in the hospital during that moment where I was like, who am I? And what is life about? And what is purpose? And how do I create something new? Um, where I started to get, and I think the first breakthrough that I had was just getting, I am not my body. Right but in a positive way, right? Like, oh, like I don't have to walk to be me. Walking's not made me me, running, swimming, <laughs> food, like, none of those things were really what made me me. Yeah. And so that gave me the freedom to start conceptualizing my sense of self from a different, more kind of inherent kind of, um, yeah, like like something that's like born from within, something that 
Absolutely. On that. Yeah. It makes me think about how attached our society is to able, like being able bodied, right? Mm -hmm. Like that is just, mm -hmm. even, even when a child's born, the doctors, the first thing the parents ask is, are all the fingers and toes there? Are yes. they able to lift out their leg? Are they able to do all these things instead of just thinking like, I'm receiving this new child into the world, however they are. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and right. so I think about your story and how, just how you explain that circumstance. And I think about how important intersectionality is and um, maybe even how prevalent the thought of ableism is. So I'm going to ask you two questions. What is ableism? <laughs> um, and then why is intersectionality so important when we're talking about ableism and disability? Yeah, great. Um, ableism is, I might ask you to repeat that second question, but yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I got it though. But ableism is um, the idea that there is a good body and that that body is the one you described at birth, right? Has five fingers, five toes, has considered typical function, um, four limbs, walks, uh, but that also includes um, having a mind that works in an abled kind of way. So ableism is believing that that kind of body is the normal body, the good body, the body worth protecting, the body worth investing in, the body worth including, right? right. And so I, I always like to draw parallels because I think it's helpful for people. So Absolutely. if we drew a parallel inside of queerness, right? Homophobia is the idea that straightness is the norm or heterosexuality, right? and that any deviation from that is a lesser version of sexuality right yeah and so it's a similar it's a similar conversation so ableism is the idea that this able body is normal and then any variation of that in terms of function whether that's in the mind or the body is almost like a broken variation of it right right so ableism uh, is the prioritization, the focus of that able body. Is that yeah. clear? Very, very. Um, and a reality that I believe I think about and um, maybe even subconsciously, unconsciously think about because it's the yeah, world that right. I'm surrounded by. Um, mm -hmm. I know we had some talks earlier off air just talking about how little we hear about disability in politics mm -hmm. Um, how little we hear about disability in the world around us. And so to my second question, it's like, what is the importance of thinking about intersectionality, diversity, and ableism together? Like, how important is that? Yeah. Well, disability exists, like you mentioned at the beginning of your introduction, disability exists in, at every intersection. And it's unique. It's a really unique experience as a minority group because disability is the only minority group that any human being can join at any time in their lives. Case in point, <laughs> right? And um, so that, that means that disability is a really relevant conversation inside of every other topic on diversity, equity, or inclusion, mm -hmm. right? especially because disability it occurs in um, kind of greater frequency where there is less access to healthcare or where there's less access to resources, um, where there's greater minority stress, right? So the people who are already most at risk for, for being able to participate or not in society are those who are also at greatest risk for becoming disabled or acquiring yeah. a disability, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, dis so intersectionality with ableism disability has to be an integral part of the conversation because those are the people in every group across the board, every intersection, who are experiencing the greatest marginalization, 
the least amount of resources. Disabled mm -hmm. people are the least employed of any minority group, despite wanting to be employed, right? So they are the people who have the clearest idea of what's missing in the conversation to include all human beings in the world, right? Oh, a hundred percent. Even you just putting it that way. Um, those were all facts that I didn't know. And mm. so I'm sure there's a lot of people that aren't aware of that. Um, and with that comes the talk about disability um, justice and like social awareness for that. And you've done a lot of work in that field. Um, you actually became the president of a nonprofit organization called Affirmation. And so I just want to know um, about your work in that field, what that entails um, and why it's so important. Mm. Yeah, no, great. The, the work in Affirmation is actually what got me into disability justice because the work in affirmation is specifically was specifically lgbtq focused okay and so it was focused on supporting lgbtq people inside of um their faith journey specifically people who were mormon or formerly mormon and it was while i was affir at affirmation looking at the solidarity the presence, the visibility of the queer movement that I paused, I looked around and I thought, what's the equivalent for disabled people? Right. <laughs> I, I don't, I, why don't I have this loud and proud group of disabled people who are changing the world, who are saying, we belong, we need to be here, we need a seat at the table, and that seat needs to be accessible, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. And I couldn't, I couldn't really find it. And that's when I started to put a little bit of a hold on some of my kind of queer advocacy and started to really get into the disability justice and found incredible people who had already been leading the way in this work who are, by and large, uh, people of color, queer people, um, women who had really started this work in a, in a really incredible way. So... I saw that my job was to just pick up the baton wherever I could and carry that forward, the work that they had already been doing, especially having the privilege of um, whiteness and the way that, you know, being cisgender, all of those things um, bring a certain level of accountability for me to kind of move the needle forward where I sit. Okay. Okay. And I love... I, what I love the most about your story is you always you always naturally intertwine what you're going through in your identity with what you can do. You never think, oh, let me let me hide this part of myself. You almost use any part of your identity to help you advance another part that you see as missing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's incredibly inspiring and incredibly motivating for all of us because there's always a piece of you that can help elevate the world. There's mm -hmm. never any part of you that needs to be hidden in any aspect. Um, and speaking of inspiration, you talk about something called inspiration porn. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I always feel a little uncomfortable <laughs> I'm so glad that you're asking about this. It's the best. Yeah. But can you um, can you explain to me and everyone what inspiration porn is um, and what your thoughts on it are? Yes. Okay. So inspiration porn is a phrase that was coined by the late Stella Young in a TED Talk, and she's a um, disabled woman who talked about how uh, inspiration porn is when disabled people are used as objects of inspiration for abled people uh, to derive yeah, their inspiration or their motivation. And so some examples of this are where, I, I see this all the time, like you'll see like, like a meme of some ripped person in a wheelchair doing a pull-up. And at the bottom will be the phrase, what's your excuse? Oh right? my gosh, I've seen that so many times. On <laughs> yes. yes, and all of us just go, oh wow, we're so like inspired by this guy. We have no excuse. 
but there's always this power differential, right? Or there's always this um, gap where we look at someone who is in a wheelchair or who is, who is disabled, inspiring us. And there's always a context of pity or struggle or, oh, that would be so hard. I could never, right? right. right. So that is inspiration porn is when it's used in a way to inspire people so that they feel good about their lives. And so disabled people are kind of objectified in that way. And disabled people can do this to themselves too if they've bought into the idea that their worth is derived from inspiring people because their life is so tragic and difficult. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like inspiration porn just feeds into the thought of ableism and the, the, uh, the dysfunctionality of that, right? Like we're always yeah. trying to do what an able-bodied person can do instead of just what our body individually right. particularly can do. Perfectly said. And I love that you pointed to that because it is brilliant and it's exactly right. Because if we looked at a disabled person living their life within the function that they have, there's nothing particularly inspiring about that except that they're just living their lives. And, yeah. right? and, yes. and, and only in a comparison against an able body that that starts to look inspiring or something. It's that yeah. comparison, right? And so when someone, and this happens to me a couple of times a week, when I go out to the gym and some well-intentioned person comes up and says, dude, I, and it's usually like a, a bro. A bro. We'll explain <laughs> what bro is. I'm, so maybe some people don't know. Yeah, I would say a bro and I'm being stereotypical. <laughs> hopefully not too problematic, but um, it would be typically a straight, muscly, very masculine presenting yeah. person. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Who comes up and is like, dude, you are so like, you're just killing it. You're so inspiring, man. Like, I just see you here, like, unbelievable. I could never. <laughs> you know, like, Not they're, they're, I could never at the end. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. They're always like, dude, I don't think I'd ever, I could ever do that. I couldn't do it if I were you. And so, it's a moment for me, and, and I'll just say like, okay, let me give you a little tweak in perspective. I said, you put on shoes and you come to the gym, and I put on shoes and a wheelchair and come to the gym. Right. You lift and I lift. Right. And I was like, and that's it. Yeah. I'm not really doing anything different than you. That's it. You know, yeah. and so it takes, and I think it's uncomfortable because it takes some of that the high of the inspiration out of it it's just so boring like oh wait you're just like lifting like me yeah you know? <laughs> and so um i think the last little piece i want to mention is that like if disabled people are inspiring and sometimes they are mm -hmm. right sometimes they're really powerful resilient just incredible human beings if they're inspiring it's because they're overcoming social obstacles to their inclusion Right. That's what's inspiring. That's really what we're seeing. But ableism has us look at a body and say, oh, that body can't get up the stairs. So it's inspiring that that person had to crawl up. Which is so problematic. Instead of saying, whoa, we created stairs that did not accommodate this person's body. And we need to change. Wow. You can, you can see the, the difference in where's the responsibility for accessibility. Is it on the body, which is ableist, or is it on society, which is anti-ableist? Yes, and not thinking about inclusion. Yes. So what are some less obvious ways and actions that we can all be anti-ableist in each of our own lives? Because I, I do think the stories and the examples that we're bringing up, I'm sure there's some people listening and watching who are like, yikes, I've made that mistake. Uh, or I've thought that. And yeah. I'm wondering, aside from building accessible ramps from pe for people, because that's something we can talk about a little bit later, um, what can we do that, from your perspective, that maybe we just don't think about doing? Yeah. There are, oh man, there are so many, um, so many pieces about accessibility, because that's really, accessibility is the response 
to ableism. Ableism is what creates inaccessibility, right? Um, and so I'm trying to think of just like some good everyday examples. One would be, for example, that to be more inclusive, you could put closed captions on your Instagram stories. Love that. Right? That's something that we, we all like, you know, speak to the camera and making it accessible for someone who's deaf or hard of hearing makes that uh, more inclusive for them. Right? That's like one example. I would say, though, that um, one of the one of a great place to practice anti-ableism and checking your own internalized ableism, which we all have, myself included, right, is to start following people who have a lot of different bodies. Following the hashtag disability justice has been so transformative for me because I'm disabled and I use a wheelchair, but I don't, I'm not autistic. I don't know what it's like to do anti-ableism world uh, work in the world of autism right so or, or a million different examples of that so following different bodies and following people with disabilities on social media is a way to start to have more exposure to those stories um and then yeah whenever you're like inspired by a disabled person it's a good person a good moment to pause and ask yourself why mm. what are my assumptions why do i feel bad for that person why, why do I feel scared that I might eventually or could have a life like that person, right? What are my assumptions about what it means to be disabled? It's a good place to start. Love that. No, those are three very, very tangible things that any of us could do uh, today, <laughs> which I love. I love that. I love that. Um, especially that recommendation for following disability justice because... Mm -hmm. That's something that you've been so integral in. And I love that there's a, a page that people can actually be a part of and interact with um, and pass on to people. Uh, and uh, that leads me to a fun fact about you that I found out, which is you got to ask um, our current vice president, Kamala Harris, before she was even vice president, <laughs> a question on national TV during a town hall event. This was before she was even vice president. Yes. What was that question and what was her response? <laughs> so good, yeah. Yeah, it was a CNN town hall. And the question was, what is your plan? <laughs> Sorry. My, my question was, because I, you know, I really put her on the spot. I said, oh, yeah. Disabled people experience disproportionate impacts from climate change right, but aren't typically included in a environmental justice conversation. Um, what is your plan to support disabled people as the climate changes and people who are um, marginalized are losing their homes and lose or are disproportionately impacted by, you know, um, hurricanes and fires and, and all of those kind of things. And she gave a, a um, like she gave a, a good broad response. Yeah, that's a question that requires a plan. That is not something. <laughs> that's that's and then she came up, yeah, and then she came up to me after they turned the cameras off, and she came up and she said, "Hey, I want you to know that I am going to go back to work and look at this, and really find a specific plan to implement for people with disabilities." Love that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Love so, that. Um, I appreciated her coming up and actually like giving me that commitment. It meant a lot. Absolutely. And I, I think that you posing that question really talks about um, what we were touching on a little bit earlier, uh, just mm -hmm. the lack of accessibility and the lack of thought around other people that are not able-bodied. Our world is created for that. We, as a whole society, are not doing a very good job with inclusivity on that. Yeah. So when you speak of diversity, you have to think about disability too. And you asking that question really shed a light on that, especially because you live in New York City. Yeah. And I think as a person living with a disability, you know better than anybody how hard it is to get around that city. Yeah, yeah. Incredibly mm -hmm. difficult. Incredibly, incredibly. It's a 
for me, it, it felt impossible. It was, well, it was literally impossible many times because the principal way of getting around New York City is a subway station and only 20% of subway stations are accessible. Um, and so accessibility is not about ramps or elevators. Accessibility is life, right? It's not about consider when you go to a restaurant and there's no ramp there. Okay, let me rewind. As a person with a disability, I'm just like everybody else. I wanna go out with some friends, enjoy a dinner, let's say. If I go and there's not a ramp there, a way for me to get inside, what I don't get to experience is a very important part of life, right. which is just like socialization, right? Um, or connecting with people. It's about what's on the other side of the ramp that, that is really what this is about. And so if you kind of build on that, then we start talking about healthcare. We start talking about work, mm. you know? And again, <clears throat> I had the privilege of having a certain amount of financial stability to be able to call an Uber for 60 bucks if I had to get home because I couldn't find an accessible station. But that's not something that everybody can do or afford. No. I could hardly afford it. I you know what I mean. <laughs> and so, um, the the yeah, the accessibility in that city is just was really, in my experience, pretty terrible. And it just made it so I couldn't live a whole life. I yeah. couldn't participate in the world. And I think stories like yours and your story really help us all reflect on what more can we do. Um, and also what, what are we not thinking about and who are we not thinking about? Mm -hmm. And so that begs me to want to ask you, like, what do you want your story to mean to the world? Mm. Um, I know that's a big question, but you have a big story. <laughs> yeah. no. It's, uh, it's a timely question because I have done a little bit of recent really uh, deep pondering about that question, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think what I want my story to ultimately be about is human worth. Because when I came out, the process of becoming free again was about learning that I actually wasn't evil or bad or depraved because I was gay. Right. And I learned that I was a worthy human being. Nothing was wrong with me. And that set me free. When I broke my neck, I had really the exact same experience, which was going from a place of I'm broken. I'm not deserving of relationships. No one will love me. Um, I'm not worthy of romance or intimacy or sex or, or uh, contribution, right? All really important pieces of life. And my experience in becoming free was the same. Yeah. Realizing in a paradigm shift that, oh, my body is perfect the way it is. And it's paralyzed. And it needs some accommodations to be included, but nothing's wrong with me. Nothing. That set me free. I so, love that. yeah. And when I say it set me free, I'm telling you, like, I really believed my life was over in 2013. Like I thought that I was doomed to live this second rate, kind of the crumbs of whatever I could have left over. And I was devastated. Um, I was depressed, I was angry, and there was so much grief there. And when I found my worth again, inside of my disability, it, like my, I got my whole life back. Like, like a true transformation, like, oh my gosh, this whole time I thought that this was second <laughs> life. This whole time I thought I couldn't be happy and, and I have everything I ever had before and I just have to do it in a wheelchair. I'm like, okay, whatever. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. That principle, I know I'm, this is a long answer, but, but that principle of like worthiness and empowering human beings to find the places in their life where they're living inside of unworthiness, that brokenness, 
identifying that and then moving into a different space, both kind of the, at this personal level, but then at the social level. Yeah. Is what I want, because those are the same things, right? There's a collective story about worthiness, who gets to belong, who deserves resources, protection, money, all of that, right? That's what social justice is really about. We're having a conversation about who's good and who's not, who's worthy, who's not, who's deserving, who's not, right? And then we build policy based off of that hierarchy of worth. So doing that at an individual level and then taking that to a great social level is just is the thing that I want to like shout from the rooftops. The thing that I want people to see is inside of that paradigm. This is about human worth. That's yeah. It. And it, it's powerful because when you live in one identity for your whole life, you feel stuck to that and yeah. you've experienced something that is monumental in which you you've experienced two identities in one lifetime. Mm-hmm. Well, not even two, two times two. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. And so you you've you've seen life at many different angles and and that's something that you can share with all of us so that we don't feel trapped in one angle and we can understand the freedom mm. to your point of what yes. living your life is really about and it's not being trapped in identity. Yeah. Um, oh, I love that. Well, I asked all my guests this last question um, to end it on a high note. Uh, here at Logitech, we have an amazing campaign called Defy Logic, and you embody that. But I do mm. want to know what defying logic means to you. Mm. Defying logic to me means pushing boundaries. It means radical, exciting, new thinking um, and an openness to um, different ways of being Mm -hmm. and existing that perhaps we hadn't considered before. Right? Yeah. I think that's what it means to me. Yeah. Yeah. I love the consider part. We rarely consider what it's like to be out of our own bodies and to be out of our own experiences. And so that was key for me. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Well, Carson, I just want to thank you. I I don't want to leave you because just I could talk to you all day, but I want to thank you for sharing your story and also thank you for using your story to change the world. I think Mm -hmm. that's what makes you so unique and so different. Um, You've taken every piece of yourself and uh, you made the world a better place with with that and with your activism and Thank you. everything that you continue to do. Mm. That means a lot to me. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, no, no. It was an honor to talk to you today. It was an honor to talk to you today. Um, and I'm sure we'll be keeping in touch and talking soon. Please. I'd love it. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, Carson. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, for joining me today on Logi Talk for our eighth episode. Carson Tuller is amazing, and that was an incredible conversation. So I hope you took as much out of it as I did. Um, Thank you for joining us as we continue to recognize the people who are pushing boundaries to inspire and change the world. This series is going to continue to share the stories of trailblazers to help inspire a new generation of creators and activists. Make sure to stay tuned for more. Bye.